So the basic trade-off with the patent is higher prices, lower supply in the short term in exchange for providing a long-term uh, incentive to, to, to innovate. Now, there's a lot wrong with that system. Hello, and welcome to the second episode of the Drayton Discourse for the year 2021, brought to you by the Economist Society at University College London. Today, we are delighted to host Mr. Tim Hartford, an English economist, author, broadcaster, and journalist, whose career has been dedicated to sharing knowledge and creative ideas regarding multiple economic issues. He is the author of The Undercover Economist, How to Make the World Add Up, 50 Things That Made the Modern Economy, and The Data Detective, 10 Fast Rules to Make Sense of Statistics. In addition to that, he is also the presenter of BBC Radio 4's More or Less, the iTunes Topping Series, 50 Things That Made the Modern Economy, the podcast Cautionary Tales, and the recent series, How to Vaccinate the World, while also working as a senior columnist at the Financial Times. Without further ado, let's proceed to the interview. In your TED Talk, you mentioned that the secret to creativity is multitasking in slow motion by reading and learning about subjects that may be seemingly relevant with your area of study. Is that a maxim you have applied to your own career by engaging with diverse topics? Um, I mean, I guess, I guess so. So this was something that I uh, started to stumble across while I was working on an earlier book called Messy. And while I was working on Messy, I was also uh, working at the BBC, writing material for the Financial Times. And then, in fact, halfway through Messi, I stopped and I wrote The Undercover Economist Strikes Back. So I wrote an entire book in the middle of writing that book. Then I came back to Messi. And um, so I suppose one of the things I was trying to do there was reassure myself that there wasn't something pathological about this behavior. But as, as I studied uh, creativity and the habits of highly creative people, both in arts and sciences, I, I came to realize. This is very common behavior. Um, most of the people that you, that you admire are people who have worked on very substantial projects uh, in parallel. And so I mean, Einstein is an example, the choreographer Twyla Tharp is an example, the screenwriter Michael Crichton, Charles Darwin. I mean, there are, there are loads of examples. There are also studies of this um, that are a little more rigorous, although, of course, creativity is a difficult thing to study. Um, and uh, I mean, one that I think is just very interesting to note is that when you compare scientists who've won Nobel Prizes with other leading scientists, the Nobel Prize winners are more likely, substantially more likely, to have really serious hobbies, like maybe to play a, a musical instrument um, at a a level where you could actually give a, a, a professional grade performance or a serious you know, art or photography habit. So yeah, we need, to, we need to mix things up. But the reason I call it slow motion is that we, what we shouldn't be doing is this constant sort of multi-screening, checking WhatsApp, checking Twitter, clicking away, doing some email, clicking back, which is extremely tempting. I find it tempting. I think we all find it tempting. So that's why I think the multitasking needs to be slowed down. Yes, of course. As one would fail to notice, your own career has indeed been incredibly diverse as well. Could you talk to us more about your transition from first working in a multinational company like Shell, then entering the public policy realm through the World Bank, and finally establishing yourself as a writer? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's, you've made it sound quite complicated. It's actually more complicated than that. And of course, of course it is, because everybody's life is, is complicated. So my uh, my first serious job was was actually as a as an economics teacher. I taught at University College Cork, and that was after my undergraduate degree and and before doing postgraduate work. Um, but I had also been doing a little bit of work at Shell for no particular reason other than you know their recruiters got hold of me. I you know and I and I had no particular desire to work for an oil company, but. Um, when I went in and met these people, they seemed interesting. And so on and off, I, I spent 
you know, a summer here, a summer there, and then more time working in the scenario planning team at Shell. And the scenario planning team at Shell is I think, it's a fascinating place. These are people, very, very diverse group of people in terms of their background and their experience, trying to think through the next 20 or 30 or sometimes 50 years. So for example, when, when I was working at Shell, uh, one of my colleagues was working on very long-term energy scenarios. And uh, another time we were talking a lot about then different options for renewables and he said uh, it's solar solar seems to be the the potentially really serious game changer in in renewables at the time and that seemed weird at the time because at the time solar was something it was so expensive you'd use it to power a calculator or a satellite the idea that you'd generate some serious energy with solar just seemed completely impossible but what he saw correctly was that it would go through the same, or at least there was a possibility of this scenario that it would go through the same cost curve as integrated circuits, as silicon. Um, and it did. Uh, and now here we are where solar power is among the cheapest sources of, of electricity anywhere in the world. So you can see why I found this a really interesting place to work, even though all of the frustrations of working for this big multinational and it's all tied into the fossil fuel industry and so on. Um, so in the end, I left and took an internship at um, the Financial Times, which was a wonderful experience. It was much, much more grown up, much more responsibility than I expected. But they, they didn't have any jobs going at the time. They said, when there's a hiring freeze on, this is just after the, the, the dot-com bubble had collapsed, it's 2003, there's a hiring freeze on, stay in touch. And so I'd, well, I'd left Shell and, I didn't have this job in journalism that I wanted. And so I started reaching out to people who I'd worked with in the past. And I was asked to go to the, to the World Bank for a couple of years, which was, again, fascinating, full of really brilliant people. Um, I'd, I'd just been married. My first child was born in Washington, D.C. It was a really wonderful time in my life. Um, and as with anybody who moves around, you know, you learn stuff by going somewhere new. Uh, but I... You know, I continued to want this, this job in journalism. And everything came together in about 2004, 2005. I got a publishing contract for this book, The Undercover Economist, that I'd been working on for years, uh, a TV show, uh, interest from radio, a job offer from the Financial Times. It really all happened at the same time. And so, of course, I left the World Bank, said, thanks, that was great, and moved back to London and, and started working with the FT. Um, and I think that those other things, and there are things I haven't mentioned, and you know, we don't want to go into all the detail, but those different things that I did, I think we, have really helped me to be a, a better economics journalist, because you, you've got that global perspective, all the storytelling of scenarios, thinking from different disciplines, thinking about the future, trying to tell stories that really persuade people about a world that they haven't seen because it doesn't yet exist, the economics teaching, it's all everything you do builds into what happens next. Yes, that does sound very fantastic, Mr. Harford. Uh, a few questions on your FT articles. First one, in your article, Lessons in Investing from John Maynard Keynes, you explain some of Keynes's methods and opinions when it comes to investment that made him successful. These include being able to change one's mind, looking at the long-term rather than short-term fluctuations, not always following the prevailing opinion, and so on. Is this always the key to success? And do you think it's still applicable in today's world? Um, I think it's, very, it's impossible to say that, you know, there's this one thing that is always the key to success. One of the things that I found, the more I read about John Maynard Keynes, there have been several, loads of books written about him, but several books written specifically about his investment strategy you start to realize there's a lot of different stuff going on. You know, he lived a very rich life. He managed several different investments. You know, he had his personal investments. He had investments on behalf of King's College Cambridge. He had uh, mutual funds that he was managing for other people. Um, there was a, a lot of different stuff going on and there were some contradictions there. So it's very easy to cherry pick and say, well, this is what he did. Was that you actually you'd find, well, he did this in say 19, 35, but in 1925, he was doing something different, or he did this with his personal investments. 
but his investments on behalf of Cambridge, he was doing something different. So it's, it's, it defies an easy summary. That said, I think Keynes's realization that he could not forecast economic fluctuations with enough precision and with enough confidence to manage a kind of cyclical investment strategy where you're basically you're moving into pro-cyclical investments in advance of a boom and then you're moving into counter-cyclical investments in advance of a bust he couldn't do it and if he couldn't do it well who can do it it's john maynard keynes we're talking about and john maynard keynes trading on insider knowledge perfectly legally the bank of england would phone him up and tell him what was going to happen to interest rates i mean this was just how things worked in the 1920s so that's an important realization i think that keynes had um, you have to get away from the short-term macro forecasting from the point of view of an investor because it couldn't be done. That was his view. Um, and I think maybe there are some people who can do it, but I certainly can't. And I think most people can't. The other thing was, and this I think is a reliable piece of advice, you constantly got to be questioning what you're doing and asking whether you should be doing something different. You constantly got to be looking for new information and being willing to change your mind. Um, that's something that Keynes had that his great rival Irving Fisher didn't have. Fisher was completely ruined by the Wall Street crash of 1929 and Keynes was fine, even though he basically made the same mistake. He just, he just moved much more quickly, was much less stubborn. Um, but also the latest research from Philip Tetlock's group um, the, the, called the Good Judgment Project, Philip Tetlock, one of my favorite psychologists, they study forecasting and in very large experiments. And their conclusion also is just a, a constant willingness to adjust and adapt, to rethink, to challenge your own thinking. This is extremely important for being a good forecaster. And I think it's probably good advice for life as well. Yes, yes, that is interesting. Speaking of forecasting, uh, something that we want to hear your thoughts about, the meme culture swept Wall Street. And there are meme stocks like Dogecoin. Uh, what kind of future do you think there is in store for them? Ah, uh, yes, stonks. Uh, I, mean, I don't know. I guess this feels very new, right? I mean, the idea that you're going to put this funny little dog on a coin and, and turn it into a cryptocurrency and, and that it's a joke. I mean, it is a joke. It's supposed to satirize Bitcoin. And then the joke itself becomes this multi-billion dollar investment. Um, or the idea that a bunch of, a bunch of people on uh, the, the Reddit, the subreddit Wall Street Bets can just decide they're going to, to pick these incredibly unloved companies. And because they're unloved, because they're being shorted by hedge funds, they're going to back them. And they're going to break the hedge funds. I mean, this, is, this is crazy stuff. This is, this is not something I would have foreseen. So if I didn't see it coming, then how can I see what happens next? But I think in a way we have seen stuff like this before. So the dot-com bubble, which um, is now 21 years old, I am old, I'm old enough to remember it. Um, it's different in some ways, but one of the things that was going on there was there was a sense there's something very new, something potentially very important, um, and then a lot of people just getting excited because other people were excited at that moment. And in hindsight, the stock market was very overvalued. Most of those stocks were very poor, poor choices. A lot of them went bankrupt. One of them was Amazon. So if you got in there, you're doing very, very nicely. So Amazon nearly went bankrupt in, if I remember rightly, I think possibly 2002 pretty close it was it was under real pressure and is now a trillion dollar company so a lot of this stuff is just being driven by general enthusiasm um now one of the things that can happen with with stonks is that they get so much money it becomes so easy for them to raise more money that that actually gives them a lot of room to maneuver you can borrow money you can pay off your debts uh, or, or sort of pay off existing debts refinance um invest in something new it is possible that some of these turnarounds can become self-fulfilling. Um, and I think that is something that we've seen with, with the case of something like Amazon and more recently with Tesla. 
But these are companies that have taken advantage of the fact that people just were so confident that they would be able to do something, that in fact they were able to do something. I think Elon Musk is an unusual character and Jeff Bezos is an even more, I think, remarkable entrepreneur. And I don't think in general that we're going to see all of these stocks staying, you know, at these, you know, going to the moon and staying there. That, that, that seems very unlikely because the one thing we know about the stock market is in the end, the value of these stocks is not what someone else will pay for them. In the end, the value is the discounted future stream of earnings. And they can't all have this discounted future stream of earnings to justify these, uh, these current valuations. So yeah, I think in 20 years time, we'll look back and one or two of them will have gone to the moon and will have stayed there. Uh, and the rest, it'll be another cautionary tale. Very interesting and very true. In another article of yours, Don't Blame GDP for a Slow Post-COVID Reopening, you point out the UK's three major policy thrusts over the past decade, austerity, Brexit, and lockdowns, and comment that national income statistics are not as prioritized as commonly believed. Do you agree with these priorities? According to you, what should be the role of GDP in today's policy making? So the basic argument I was, I was picking up in that piece was um, I, I was taking issue with the assertion that you hear a lot, which is that uh, politicians are obsessed with GDP. And so GDP defines policy. And therefore, um, because GDP is, is a bad measure of um, basically of national flourishing. It's not a very good measure of welfare. It's not, a, it's, not, it's not intended to be a good measure of welfare. Because this indicator is so badly broken, um, it's a very bad guide to policy and it needs to change. Now, to me, the, that argument, I, let, me, let me give you an analogous argument that I, th I think might help. You, you've got a car and you're driving along and people say, look, um, you can't just maximize the speed of this car. Um, that's extremely dangerous. You have to consider things like the direction, safety, uh, fuel efficiency. You can't just sort of slam your foot on the accelerator and just accelerate and accelerate and accelerate until you reach the maximum possible speed. Like You can't just do that. Therefore, we need to fix the speedometer. Well, my my argument would be, well, I, I agree with everything you've said, except like there's nothing wrong with the speedometer. It tells you the speed of the car. And also, who maximizes the speed of the car? Nobody maximizes the speed of the car. Who ever got into a car and just maximized the speed? It doesn't, maybe one or two people, but you know, that's not how it works. We all have these different priorities. And it seems to be the same with um, the way that you know, we have these political arguments about what matters, what we want to do. Um, GDP, I don't think, features very highly. Uh, jobs, I think, feature highly. Inflation fe features highly. These are, these are sort of big economic indicators. Tax, the deficit, the debt. If you, look, if you want to look at, at economic indicators that really do shape policy and weigh high in policymakers' concerns, you'd look at those. And then you'd weigh them against other things. For example, public health, as we've seen, the climate, uh, and so on. National sovereignty, as we see with the Brexit debate. So... You know, if, if the speedometer doesn't tell you the speed, then we need to fix the speedometer. And I think there are some technical objections you might make to GDP where you would say um, that they, they're, they're not actually telling us the value of, it doesn't tell us the value of national income. It's missing something or it's, it's miscalibrated one way or another. But fundamentally to say, we, we, you know, we no longer want the speedometer to tell us the speed at all. I think that's just misunderstanding what's going on. And you only have to look at, at these examples like Brexit, for example, or, or lockdowns um, or austerity. These are, these, are, these are the three most important you know, policy moves of the last decade. None of them are GDP maximizing. None of them pretended to be GDP maximizing. So you know, by, by all means, we need good indicators to help us make decisions about welfare, mental health, education, the environment, gender equality, and so on. We need good indicators. Um, but I think just wrestling with GDP until it, it isn't GDP anymore, I don't think really solves the problem.
congratulations on how to make the world add up yes here it is available now in paperback <laughs> yeah um pop to your local bookshop there we go anyway sorry go on yes uh, you have beautifully summarized the art of dealing with statistics and establishing fact-based opinions in 10 rules of thumb. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Mr. Harper, is the reason why mistrust with information has particularly grown in recent years? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And one of the reasons it's interesting is it, it, we, I think, don't think we know that, it's, that mistrust in statistics has grown. Um, it depends a lot on what you mean. There are different attempts to measure trust in different institutions, different experts. Um, you might argue that the fact that the, the entire country is now glued to the COVID dashboard, uh, trying to understand what happens next indicates that we have a tremendous amount of, uh, of faith in statistics. So it depends which, you know, which examples you look at and how you ask the question. But what I do think is true, and something I really wanted to push hard against in my book, is that we professional nerds, the statisticians, economists, science communicators, we are not always helping the problem. Because very often when we talk about statistics, then the natural way to make it accessible, to make it fun, is to call somebody out for getting it wrong. The, you know, the, the, the smackdown. The, the, the fact checking. This is something that my BBC program more or less does somewhat. And I, I've, you know, I've tried to make sure we don't do it too much. And the reason that, that I think that that's, it is a problem if that's what we, the only thing we do is that, okay, fine, you can correct a thousand statistics, but what is the overall impression you're giving? You're giving the overall impression that statistics can't be trusted. And if that's the impression that people get, that's a tragedy. Because statistics, they're like radar, they're like a telescope, like an x-ray machine. They're showing us things about the world we can't see in any other way. Um, you can see this very clearly over the last year with the coronavirus. All of these key pieces of information that we want to know about the virus. Where did it come from? How fast does it spread? How fast is it spreading right now? How dangerous is it? Who's most at risk? How do we treat it? How do we prevent the spread? Do the vaccines work? what treatments are available, all of these questions and more, they're all statistical. You've got, you've got no chance, no chance at all without statistics. And so that's why I'm encouraging my fellow geeks to try to, um, you know, not put a positive spin on statistics, but to remember to give examples also of when statistics answered questions, solved problems, told us important truths, not just examples of statistics being used to mislead and deceive. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Uh, the first chapter of your book shows how our emotions can play a role in governing our actions. And this belongs to a whole literature which opposes the idea of homo economicus, where individuals are rational uh, decision makers. How relevant do you think the concept of homo economicus is today in the economics discipline? So I, I discussed this with Richard Thaler um, about five years ago. Richard Thaler, of course, recently won the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics for his work on behavioral economics. He's one of the most famous and important behavioral economists in the world. Um, and he basically said, look, if you want a single unified theory of human behavior, you're basically not going to do better than Homo economicus. You won't, you won't be able to produce a model that is kind of straightforward and tractable, mathematically analyzable and reasonably universal that will depart much from Homo economicus. And um, he also said, by the way, he doesn't think Homo economicus is a particularly great predictor of human behavior. But I think that, that Thaler's response does indicate why Homo economicus is still relevant. Um, it does help us understand a lot of the issues that uh, you know, economists face, that economists face, with thinking about questions of competition policy, for example, how do consumers respond to, 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 to different prices, to competition in, in various markets, what would be the response to uh, a change in taxation or a, a change in benefits, um, what if we introduced a carbon tax, how would people respond? Actually, homo economicus is, is really not a bad way of of analyzing these, these uh, 
questions. So that's why I think it's there. I don't think it's there simply because economists are stupid and stubborn. I mean, economists can be stupid and stubborn, but I don't think that's the only reason. I think it is useful. We just need to bear in mind its limits. Um, and Richard Thaler is you know, a person who's done more than most to teach us those limits. Um, yeah, that's, my, that's what I think about it. Mm -hmm. Yes, now moving on to arguably the most relevant topic today. The UN Health Agency called the unequal distribution of COVID vaccines economically and epidemiologically self-defeating. Do you think that lifting vaccine patent protection would make their distribution more equitable? So I have not seen anybody explain to me how, um, how patents are causing a problem in this case. I, just, I don't have a principled objection to suspending patents. Patents, patents involve a trade-off. So the basic trade-off, and forgive me, because I know this kind of seems obvious, but people seem to forget it all the time in, in discussions of this. So the basic trade-off with a patent is um, I'm giving the inventor or whoever, the patent holder, um, monopoly power over this invention. And we know what monopoly power means. It means higher prices and lower supply. Um, why would I do that? Why would I create this distortion? Well, the answer is um, that maybe without the patent, you don't get the invention at all. Because some, some stuff's really expensive to invent. And when people are put, you know, hiring hundreds of scientists, running these huge randomized trials, et cetera, et cetera, they need some confidence that once they've done all that, that the, the next person over can't just walk over, have a look and, and copy the idea. So that's the basic trade-off. You know, higher prices, lower supply in the short term in exchange for providing a long-term uh, incentive to, to, to innovate. Now, there's a lot wrong with that system, I would say. Um, for a start, a lot of the stuff that gets patented isn't actually very expensive. It's just like stuff that people dream up in the shower. So why do you need to protect that? Why is there some you know, glorious reward for whoever just happens to dream up the idea? Um, and very often you find when there's technological breakthrough, like a new platform like a smartphone, a load of stuff which was previously impossible to imagine suddenly is easy to imagine, like you know, podcasting. Um, and then it's just a race to whoever gets the obvious idea to the, to the patent office first. It doesn't make any sense. Um, so there's a lot I think that we could do differently. But so it, you know, if people say, that if people could convince me that suspending patents is going to work in this case, then fine. Um, particularly since a lot of this, these drugs were in fact, these vaccines were funded very heavily from the public purse. The only problem is I don't, I don't understand how it's going to work. Like, we do, what do we think? So AstraZeneca, like they're being, they're being sued last time I looked, by the European Union for just not being able to produce fast enough. It's not like they're restricting supply in order to get more money out of the EU. Like they've signed a contract, they've agreed a price, and now they can't deliver on that price. So it turns out it's hard to make vaccines. It's really hard to make vaccines. Everybody I've spoken to, and I presented a BBC series about vaccines um, earlier this year, Everybody said they are among the most complicated products in the world. They're much more complicated than a, than a regular uh, drug, for example. Um, so the problem is you know, getting the factories, getting the production processes uh, um, ironed out, enough skilled workers, um, supply of things like the needles, the vials, um, adjuvants is a, a substance derived from the particular cork tree in South America. None of this is really de um, dependent on patents. And there is a risk that you suspend a patent and then well, people start to try to set up these factories and that just increases the chaos and increases the demand for all of these inputs without actually expanding um, output. So I I've yet to be convinced, but it, I, don't, I don't at all reject it in principle. And I do think that whatever we do, we need to try to produce as much as possible. So that means maximum possible cooperation, maximum possible government spending. Governments have spent a lot, they could spend more. Um, being willing to subsidize factories that are gonna be built and then run for a year and then maybe never be used again. And that's, that's 
one of the things that vaccine manufacturers are worried about. You, know, you try to vaccinate 8 billion people twice a year, then what do you do? You, you, you did it. I mean, maybe, maybe we have to vaccinate them all again and again and again, but quite possibly not. So um, it's a really serious issue. Um, but for me, patents have just not, they're not really engaged with, with, with the real problem. So following up on that and expanding more, how optimistic are you about President Biden's recent pledge of $2 billion to be used through the COVAX facility? For those not familiar with this, it is a movement that aims to provide vaccines to developing countries. Does this indicate a future where there is better coordination and a better allocation of COVID vaccines? Well, it's a good start. It's a good start. So the advantage of COVAX is that um, the idea is that you're pooling uh, resources and you're supplying vaccines to uh, all sorts of lower income countries that need them. Um, no one was ever really able to explain to me exactly how COVAX worked, which I think is is interesting in and of itself. Um, so, yeah, right. I'm all I'm all in favour. Two billion dollars is what six dollars per American. Um, it's not it's not like a huge deal. It's not an enormous sum of money. And um, if we need what fifteen billion doses, the cheapest available doses are probably the AstraZeneca doses. They're maybe four dollars each. So we're talking what sixty billion that we need. And the U.S. has pledged two billion. I think that suggests gives us gives us a hint of of the scale of what's involved. It's not. It's a good start. It's a good start. And right now, um, what's really needed is more factories and more doses. Um, the money is kind of uh, comes later. Um, so, yeah, I'm I'm hopeful. Uh, but what we're going to see, I think, is rich countries, for understandable reasons, will just not. Be releasing doses until they've vaccinated everybody and you can i mean it's just the way the way things are you look in the, the uk right now we've vaccinated more than 80 percent of the adult population with one dose more than 50 percent with two doses um and yet cases are rising exponentially we now have the highest case count in europe um the job's not finished right the vaccines work but the job's not finished and not everyone is vaccinated and we've slowed down our release from lockdown, I think it would be strange, strange politics for Boris Johnson, the UK prime minister to turn around and say, we're gonna stop now um, because there are un unvaccinated people in Thailand, unvaccinated people in Brazil, you know, who are highly vulnerable, who are in, in their eighties. And those people need these doses more than British people. I mean, morally that's the right call but i mean it's, it's not going to happen so there's no point in yeah and you can see why just to phrase it like that you can see why it won't happen one more field which requires incredible amounts of global coordination is climate change now you mr harford have long argued in favor of carbon taxes as one of the responses to climate change However, one of the reasons why governments have faced, have not been able to institute uh, carbon taxes is because of the intense pressure and lobbying from the oil and gas industry. Uh, how do you suggest we tackle this issue? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure that I quite agree with the premise of the question. So speaking of somebody who a long time ago, I mean, I've, I'm not carrying the torch for the oil industry, but a long time ago, I used to work for Shell, as we've discussed. I remember sitting in a room uh, in Shell Centre 21 years ago, um, trying to do some emergency scenario planning because um, the country was running out of fuel. And the country was running out of fuel because people were uh, protesting outside uh, refineries where you know, the oil tankers come in, pick up petrol or diesel, uh, and then go out and, and fill up fuel stations. And so people were blockading these refineries, preventing the tankers getting out. And as a result, uh, I mean, the real issue was there was an immediate panic. People rushed out, filled up their cars. All of the petrol stations ran out of fuel instantly. So that's, a, that's an issue. Why did that happen? Um, that happened basically because people were protesting against another rise in the price of petrol. There's more tax put on petrol. 
uh, at a time when underlying oil prices were also quite high, so the cumulative effect, it was mostly the tax. Now, I don't know what Shell was lobbying for at the time. Um, my understanding is that most European oil companies are now want carbon tax, I think. Um, I'm sure it's a bit more complicated and a bit more kind of sneaky behind the scenes, but I think they at least, I believe they say they want a carbon tax. Um, but the, the basic, this was a spontaneous outpouring of anger from certain people who felt the petrol taxes were too high. This is not Shell arguing that petrol, petrol taxes were too high. I mean, Shell just wanted the, <laughs> the rioting to stop and be able to start delivering petrol again. Um, I think the British government, everyone in British politics noticed that and learned from that experience. Um, so I think the reason that we don't have a carbon tax is not as straightforward as just saying, well, the, the oil companies are lobbying for it. I think there's a lot of popular opposition to it. There's a lot of popular support for it as well, which I think we need to encourage and we need to galvanize, we need to get people on the right side. And I, I find it slightly frustrating that many environmentalists still don't really seem to understand why it would be a good idea or um, you know, why, why we should support such a proposal. But um, you know, this, is a, this is a popular movement based on the fact that people don't want stuff to get more expensive. Taxes on carbon, on fossil fuels, um, very quickly work into more expensive products, particularly at the pump. It's very highly salient. The, it's also very highly salient with domestic heating bills. For, for since the early 1990s, I believe, uh, and perhaps before, VAT on central heating has been much lower than VAT on other products. And that's the exact opposite of what you want for climate change, the exact opposite. Why does it happen? Again, it's perceived as being a social justice issue that the poor uh, pay more and it's not fair for them to pay, not, not even like an extra tax, but it's not even fair for them to pay the same tax on that as they would pay on any other product. They have to pay a lower tax. And again, this is, I forget the details because even I was young back then in the early 90s, but this is a highly politically contentious issue. So it's not as straightforward as just, oh, the oil companies click their fingers and that's why it doesn't happen. There's more going on. Um, I think what's interesting is one of the reasons that we see a shift now is because the, the underlying technology is changing. There have been subsidies for solar power. Um, that's led to a lot of uh, learning by doing. The price of solar power is falling fast. It's not the only um, form of alternative energy. Um, but suddenly people are looking around and going, These, the oil companies are not going to be here forever because solar is coming. Uh, General Electric in serious financial trouble because it had this gas turbine business that just kind of evaporated. So with their power waning, then the politics changes. So in a way, we, you know, we might get a carbon tax about sort of 40 years after we needed it. And just at the point at which we probably doesn't make any difference anyway. But there we go. Talking about alternatives, what are your thoughts on other ideas proposed, like the use of a cap and trade scheme or the creation of an international agreement to deal with lower carbon emissions? Okay, well, these are potentially all the same thing. So cap and trade and a carbon tax is basically the same policy. It's just a different um, framework for implementing the policy. Um, so the, the way to think about this is that um, a carbon tax regulates price, whereas a cap and trade scheme regulates quantity. But you know, you can you can draw yourself a supply and demand curve. And in a, in a world of perfect information, it's exactly the same thing. And in a world where there's uncertainty, the question is which uncertainty is more damaging? Is it uncertainty about climate, about carbon emissions, or is it uncertainty about prices? What, what should should we be more worried that um, or that the price of the permit goes higher, suddenly goes higher than we thought or should we be more worried that there's more carbon emissions in a particular year than we expected I and mean, the answer to that's not clear um, you know exactly how it works but you can you can turn these two things into exactly the same so for example you can have a cap and trade scheme with uh, with a it's called a something sort of collar and cap so that the you release extra permits if the price goes too high so you're basically saying oh it's cap and trade but if it goes too high it turns into a tax at this level um, you, you have that, you can have bankable permits. 
So you say, well, if, if the price is really low right now, then you keep the permits and you save them and you, you release them later. Well, in that case, then the price will rise because the permits are bankable. As for an international agreement, I think all of these things, they have to be internationally agreed. It's not like every country in the world needs to agree. It's not like it needs to be some huge grand system, but there needs to be some kind of coordination. If you've got major economies with very, very different implicit prices on carbon, then you're going to get a lot of um, arbitrage is not quite the word, word, but people will move. They'll put their polluting factories wherever the, the carbon is, is cheaper. So you need some sort of agreement, but it doesn't need to be this huge kind of cap and trade scheme. You could just say, <clears throat> for example, look, uh, the Americans say, look, we're going to put a, a tax of whatever, $100 a ton on carbon, uh, and we'll do this. And the Chinese, you need to agree also to put a tax of at least uh, 500 renminbi a ton on carbon. And the Europeans agree that they're going to put a tax of you know, at least 80 uh, euros per ton of carbon, etc. And everyone's like, you know, the tax is going to be a bit different. It won't be exactly the same. Different er you know, areas will get to levy their own taxes. They'll have their own rules. They get their own revenue. But it's, you know, there's some coordination. That sort of scheme may be the way forward. I don't really see the current, well, I say current fashion, less fashion, for just setting these targets a long way in the future. I don't really see how that helps. I mean, it's fine for, for you know, a, a politician who's, you know, 70 years old or older to say that in 2050, such and such a thing is going to happen. I mean, these, none of these people will be alive in 2050. I might, you will, but they won't. And they certainly won't be in power. So I'm not so interested in the targets. I'd rather see actual policy instruments capable of achieving change by changing people's incentives, which is one of the, not the only way to get people to change what they do, but it's a very powerful way to get people to change what they do. If you could host any historical figure on your podcast, who would it be? And what kind of questions would you like to ask him or her? So I, people can look on my website, uh, timharford.com. A few months ago, I published a, uh, a fantasy dinner party. So the idea is you can choose anybody, um, I think alive, dead, uh, fictional or non-fictional, choose the meal, choose the drinks and describe the dinner party. Uh, so the people I included there included um, Dave Arneson, who was one of the creators of Dungeons and Dragons, uh, Lynn Ostrom, who's the first woman to win a Nobel Prize in economics, Nobel Memorial Prize in economics, Claude Shannon, great computer scientist, Maddie Pryor, because um, she's a great musician, uh, and Florence Nightingale, the uh, pioneering uh, nurse and statistician. Um, Nightingale, if people are interested to know more about Nightingale, there's quite a lot of stuff in, in my book, How to Make the World Add Up. But I also did a Cautionary Tales podcast and Helena Bonham Carter played Nightingale. Absolutely wonderful to hear. And I told the story about how she really broke new ground in using data visualization to achieve social change. She launched a revolution with a pie chart and how she did it, why she did it, and the, did she cut corners? Um, it's a very interesting story. So. Nightingale is a person I would absolutely love to, uh, to have to dinner and to, to, uh, to, to interview her. Thank you for listening to the Data and Discourse. If you enjoyed this interview, leave us a rating and subscribe for more content like this every month. Get in touch with us on Facebook or Instagram at The Economist Society. Thank you once again and have a great day.